So these are what the orbits of the Pluto system look like. So due to the mass of its largest moon, Charon, Pluto has an orbit around the very center of the system with a semi-major axis that is greater than its own radius. Which you can see in the diagrams, you can see it's orbiting around that central dot in the middle, which represents the very center. So this is as opposed to a system like the Earth-Moon system, where the mass of the moon also shifts the barrier center away from the geometric center of the Earth, but that shift is smaller than the Earth's radius, so the barrier center is still within Earth's radius, which causes a wobble instead of an orbit, as can be seen for Pluto's case. So in this video, I'm going to be going over Pluto's planetary status, and I'm also going to be going over a bit of spice files and kind of go deeper into how you can see all the data that JPL actually publishes publicly and how I did all the analysis for this video, and you can do your own analysis as well. So first, we have to start out with what is the definition of a planet, which in 2006, astronomers met at the International Astronomical Union to decide to actually change the definition and downgrade Pluto to actually a dwarf planet to create kind of a new category. So that's where they find the new planet of the, or the new category of a dwarf planet. So to go over kind of what the definition of a planet is and was, is that a planet is a celestial body if it is in orbit around the sun, which Pluto checks that box. Number two, it has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome its rigid body forces, so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium, which basically just means that it's roughly spherical, uh, which Pluto does that too. And then the third thing is it has cleared its neighborhood around its orbit, which they decided that Pluto has not. Um, so how you can think of that last one, cleared the orbit, cleared the neighborhood around its orbit, is that the body has to have a majority of the mass of the objects in its own orbit. So to give an example, uh, Jupiter actually has a lot of asteroids that are trapped in its Lagrange point, so those are in its orbit around the sun. But even if you add up all the mass of those asteroids, Jupiter is still much greater than that combined mass. So Jupiter has cleared its neighborhood around its own orbit. So that's kind of a way to think about that definition. And then decided that Pluto doesn't actually match this case because the total mass of the Kuiper belt or the trans-Neptunian objects, which are the objects that are farther from the sun than Neptune, the mass of all those, Pluto is actually a small percentage of that compared to all those. So it decided that it has not cleared its own neighborhood, where they now define a dwarf planet as being in orbit around the sun. Pluto checks that, has sufficient mass to be roughly spherical, checks that, has not cleared its neighborhood, and it's not a satellite. And not a satellite is important because, say, our moon is a satellite, but it's not a planet. Uh, but it is actually larger than Pluto, so you have to make sure you include that definition. And they also um, basically said that all other objects are referred to as small solar system bodies. So to first get to the mass of Pluto, um, and one of the other reasons, kind of an outlier from all the other planets, is that the percentage mass of the body itself compared to its entire system. So in this case, I have a little table that goes over kind of the percentage mass of each of the planets, where I excluded Mercury and Venus because they actually don't have moons, so they're 100% of their whole system mass. But say for the Earth, it's actually only 97.8% of the mass of the Earth-Moon system. So the moon is actually quite large. And you can see it in this plot how the Earth even is a little bit of outlying with everyone else here because its moon is actually pretty big. Our moon's pretty big. So for Mars, uh, with its two moons, uh, for, I'm spacing on their names, but um, it, Mars still makes up an overwhelming majority percent of it, 99.99 a bunch. Uh, Jupiter actually has a lot of moons, so it's not quite as much as Mars as far as percentage mass, but still a lot. And then the outlier here, obviously, is Pluto, which only has 89% because its uh, largest moon, Charon, is so large compared to it that it actually brings its percentage down a bit. And I also wanted to add the sun here just to show this is kind of more of a fun thing that doesn't have to do with definition of a planet. But the sun is actually an overwhelmingly large amount of the mass of the whole solar system, 99.86%, just to kind of show how large it really is. So as far as also talking about the Kuiper Belt objects and getting into spice files a bit. So these are... Um, so. JPL published a bunch of data for their New Horizons mission for objects that are kind of trans-Neptunian objects that they might run into. So they actually went ahead and published that. So I used that data to kind of show some objects that are in the Kuiper belt. So in this example, the black orbit is the orbit of Neptune, just to get a kind of a feeling of how far this is. So in the orbit of Pluto, you can see is off axis from that, which I showed in the solar system plots video, which I'll have linked in the description. But we already knew that, that its um, inclination is actually off axis quite a bit with compared to the rest of the planets. And then we just have some other objects that are out there, which we know about now that we didn't know about before, before that first definition of what a planet is. And so what they were finding is that these objects are actually more similar to Pluto than Pluto was to the rest of the planets. Um, and I'm going to go over uh, how I did that in the 
in Python real quick. Just I'm just going to glaze over it because a lot of it is pretty much the same as the solar systems video, just with a different spice file. So you have all the necessary things like what frame you want to be in, what your observer is going to be. Oh, so this is actually for the initial plot of the Pluto system. So first I'm going to show the script that I used to create this plot. So that's what it is. So the observer is the Pluto Barrier Center we, because we want all the bodies with respect to the Pluto Barrier Center. We have all the four bodies that we want and then we have to furnish certain spice files. So a solar system kernel just gets the Pluto Barrier Center with respect to the sun and then has also the time uh, the time seconds or uh, leap seconds uh, kernel that you have to load in order to get uh, specific ephemeris for specific times. And then you also want to furnish the NH Pluto 017 BSP. So that's basically NH stands for New Horizons, which is what JPL published for the mission and basically what they used, which can be found here. Um, in this URL, basically, they just publish a bunch of data that they use for this mission. And then so if you go to their info file, which is just a text file, it shows here. So this directory contains the kernel files for the New Horizons spacecraft, mission targets, and solar system bodies. So that this is what it is here. And then I have this one. So the ephemeris data for Pluto, Sharon, Nix, and Hydra. So that's what I use for this case. And so then very simple, just for each name, get the ephemeris data uh, from the time that I want it, and then write it out to a CSV, and then plot it. This is actually pretty simple, and it's pretty similar uh, to what I did for the solar system. Uh, video. So then to get the masses, this actually uses another data file that actually has the physical um, gravitational parameters. So that's this gmde431.tpc. Uh, and again, I'll show where that is. So that is here. So this is actually just in their generic kernels. They have d431, where d431 is just a data set that they release of ephemeris data. So the latest one, I believe, is 432. But for 431, they also publish the gravitational parameters. Um, so, and this is a text-based file, so you can just read it, but then you can just load it in with a uh, spicy pie and then it parses it for you. So what it has here is that it has all the bodies that it has the gravitational parameters for, where one through nine are the very centers of each system. So Mercury, very center, Venus, very center, Earth, Mars, and so on. And then these are the bodies within each system, specific bodies. So 199 um, is Mercury, 299 is Venus, and then 301 is actually our moon, and 399 is the Earth. So the 99s mean the planets, and the 01, 02, and so on mean each moon. And I'll go over the numerical convention uh, in here a bit too. So I just did for N and planets, where I just did 1 through 9, which are the planets. The way that you actually get the mass of it, or it's actually the gravitational parameter, but it's analogous with the mass, uh, use this, this spice function called BOD VCD. And then in order to get the actual ID of the planet itself, you have to take whatever it is. So say for three, it's Earth. So three times 100 is 300 plus 99. So that's 399. And that's the body ID of the Earth. And then the second argument is what you want. So what attribute do you want from this body ID? And we want GM, which is a gravitational parameter. And we just want one value because GM only has one value. And these indexes are just necessary because of the way that the SPICE function returns the values. Um, you can look more into it in the SPICEPY documentation, but that's just how it is. So that's, so that's just what I did. I got the mass of the planet, and then I got the mass of the very center of the system itself, uh, which is just N, which is just uh, you know the numbers 1 through 9 doing the same thing, calculate the ratio of the planet or the mass of the planet with respect to the Berry Center, and then put it on the semi-log X plot. Um, just like, oh, actually, I actually haven't showed that. Oh, oh wait, yeah, I did show it. So yeah, so that's here. Yeah, so that's how I made that plot. Basically, yeah, so that's just a semi-log X, and then in order to annotate, this is a new command that I haven't really shown before um, in matplotlib, so that's what it is. Uh, you want the name of the planet with bod C2S, where you give it the ID and it gives you the name of the planet. Um, plot the point and all that. These are just um, just different labels that you can use and kind of get fancy with matplotlib. And then I also included the sun here, so calculate the the combined mass of the of all the planets and then get the ratio with the sun. And then I also did the moon here, where I just put 100 for the moon, where it isn't actually just to show kind of the comparison with the masses. And here is just putting everything together with all the labels. And then for the Kuiper Belt objects, what I did, um, same thing. The most important thing is just making sure you get the right spice file. So in this Kuiper Belt objects.mk file, this is why I loaded in where you have the latest leap seconds, D432, which is the ephemeris data of the solar system, which is, I needed that for um, Saturn or Neptune, uh, which, yeah, the one I plotted. Uh, this is for the Pluto system. And then KBO, Centaur, with all these numbers, is those uh, all those other bodies that I plotted with Pluto. And yeah, and yeah, those are the other bodies. So 
Uh, this one is actually, again, really straightforward. Uh, we're here in the initially, I just create this ephemerides list. Um, and oh yeah, so what I did is got the initial state of Neptune using its body ID, which is eight. Oh, that's the barrier center, but basically the same thing uh, as far as just being able to put it in a plot. Frame observer, where the frame and observer, um, where the frame is eclipsed at J2000, and zero is the solar system barrier center. That's just the ID for the solar system barrier center. And so I got first, um, got the Fermis data for Neptune, then propagated just one orbit of it uh, using the orbit propagator class. And then uh, for each of the rest of the IDs, uh, which I have here, so these are just IDs of these bodies, which you can find in the spice file, um, just reading them. And then just get the Fermis data for each uh, for one time, and then uh, propagate one orbit of them using, again, the orbit propagator class. And then after that, just plot the orbit. So these are actually pretty straightforward scripts that I just made in order to do all these. Oh, and one more thing um, that I actually found and I needed to calculate the masses of these was to find what the, uh, what basically JPL publishes as the uh, gravitational constant, which you can find here. And again, I'll post a link in the description, but um, just here it is. So basically just, you can find what JPL defines at all these values. And then this is what I use for the gravitational constant. So yeah, just wanted to show that. And that's pretty much it for this video. Um, if you liked it, make sure you give me a thumbs up to help me out with the YouTube algorithm. And the next video, and it's actually gonna be the next few videos, I'm gonna be covering ground tracks. So these are actually pretty useful and I explained them in the previous videos, but basically what they are is plotting out where the orbit is over with respect to the surface of the earth and different types of orbits have very different ground tracks and they're used very strategically to do earth observation, communication, and things like that. So that's it for this video. Uh, let me know if you have any questions in the comments and thank you for watching.